One of the ways that we can hold the sacredness of all human beings is to separate our attitudes and behaviors and actions from our inherent goodness. Our attitudes and behaviors come from the ways that we haven't been able to heal from oppression. And this is true both as individuals and as groups. I'm Nancy Luna Jimenez, and I'm the founder of the Luna Jimenez Institute for Social Transformation. And I'm gonna ask you to redefine culture. Children are brilliant in their ability to assess their environments and where adultism shows up, they're gonna take on patterns of behavior in order to minimize the hurt and abuse that's coming at them. So for example, if every time a young person speaks up, they get shamed and humiliated, they're gonna figure out, well, I can't, I don't wanna keep getting shamed and humiliated and there's no place for me to have my feelings about being shamed and humiliated because when I do, I get sent to my room or isolated or further punished. So brilliantly, young people decide I'm not gonna talk. Pretty soon that behavior of not talking wins them some great experiences of not getting shamed and humiliated. And so the pattern, that decision early, that one-time decision now becomes a rigid pattern because they keep not getting shamed and humiliated. Pretty soon adults are now responding to that pattern of not talking as if that was the child, as if that might have been their quote, personality. And depending on the body that that child lives in, we could say, oh, that child is so good because they don't talk, or we could say that child is really shy, or we could say that child doesn't um, is uh, uninterested in interacting with others, or a snob, etc. There could be all sorts of attributions given to that child because the child doesn't talk. But the child's decision to not talk was rooted in a hurt that they weren't able to heal, and so they took on that pattern. I'm going to offer that so do groups. Groups are targeted with oppression. And sometimes the group pattern behavior becomes so familiar that we mistake it for culture. A group's patterned response to the effects of oppression is not culture. Culture is benign. Culture is a style. It can be distinguished from other people's. But we wanna to offer to you that no culture would willingly or want to target or hurt another human group. That's not inherent in any culture. And so like the child, these group pattern behaviors become confused with the culture. Patterns can't be reasoned with, they can't be taught, they can't be willfully or by sheer decision eliminated. And so it is in our best interest to separate out a culture which is benign from a group's patterned response to oppression. An example that I come from my own experience is the confusion that somehow Latina men are more sexist than any other men who are socialized in a sexist society. And for the record, let me just say that to believe that is racism. All men have been socialized to take on patterns of sexism and male domination. And remember, all men are good. So this isn't about good and bad men. All men carry these hurts. And to somehow think that some group of men have it worse, have worse sexism than others, is to load a particular culture with sexism, which we know can't be true because sexism is everywhere. My father was a stay-at-home dad. He raised three daughters. And what he would get was, oh, you know, he's becoming agringado, he's becoming white, he's losing his culture. Yet, when a white man stays home and raises children or starts to treat the women in his lives as equals, no one would suggest that he's becoming less white in order to be more just and liberatory in his treatment towards females. And yet, when we see this behavior, in Latina cultures or in African-American BIPOC cultures, we tend to say that that group is then becoming assimilated. What is left for me as the female child in that environment? The non-choice was that I either had to stay in connected with my Latina culture and embrace everything about that, including somehow being oppressed as a female, or if I didn't wanna be oppressed as a female, 
It meant that I needed to leave my group or in other words, assimilate out of my group. That is a non-choice that people who are white do not have to make. Females who are white do not have to make. They can decide to say no to sexism and still be white. The shift that I wanna to offer to you is that if we can separate culture from the group patterned response to oppression, then we can fight together to end sexism as an oppression. Instead of what white women said to me when I wanted to battle sexism and went looking for allies in white communities, oh, your culture, it's so sexist. Come be with us as females and we'll fight that. And what I'm hearing is, wait, you want me to lose the soft sounds of Spanish in my history and my culture and my family? You want me somehow to disconnect with and have less esteem for my father and my uncles and my male cousins? It was not a choice that I could make. If we can see sexism as an oppression that runs through every cultural context, then I can stand with my Iranian sisters and say, let's work together to fight race sexism in your cultural context, which looks different than my cultural context. And then white women can come to me and say, let's fight sexism as it looks in my cultural context. And Japanese women can say, let's come together and fight how sexism looks in my cultural context. In other words, we come together to fight the oppression instead of globbing the oppression into the group. It's a radical shift that I'm asking you to make to unlearn the ways that we have been mistaught culture, that anything that happens in any one given group more than once in any one given year, we're gonna call that all culture. I'm gonna ask you to set that aside and to see what becomes possible when we can pull out the effects of oppression from who the group and the culture 